Okay, and welcome back. So today we're going to talk about conceptual and pop art, this incredibly dynamic moment. It's an incredible moment because it's a complete reversal of all the trends in modern art up until this point. Modernism from the 30s and up to the mid-century was moving towards greater abstraction, uh, greater formalism, and pop art reverses all of that. We had given up on representation, and pop art goes back to representation. We had given up on narrative or symbolism in favor of just abstraction and expression, and pop art and conceptual art goes back to that. So it almost is a complete reversal of everything that the modernists said that they had been fighting for. So why did this happen? Well, on one level it happened because people change. That's just life. Clement Greenberg was kind of convinced that once modernism arrived, it would exist forever, that it was the purest art. There's many things you can say about Clement Greenberg, but you can't call him a snob. He actually did believe that modernism was the most universal form of art. Because when you look at a Jackson Pollock, there's not anything to get. There's nothing to explain. It is what it is. And that means it would be universally approachable by all people. But of course, I think that looking back at that, that's naive. People are always going to change. And it makes sense that change happens because by this time, the avant-garde had built in this idea of change as a function of the movement, that you know, you're know you going to challenge the status quo. And the second that modernism became the status quo, the second it became the establishment, it had to be challenged. How could you get there? How could you say you know you were avant-garde if you were part of the establishment? So we have to explain how did this happen? What were the social contexts that allowed for this complete reversal? And how is it that modernism ended up being utterly and completely repudiated within about 20 years of this triumphal moment where it was all dominant? Well, to explain that, we have to get a little bit into history and economics. And I'm not going to lie, I love these kind of things, but this may get a little dry for you. I'm going to try and cut this as short as I can. It's the most condensed version possible. So let's get into this. The first thing you have to realize is the post-war period was a period of unprecedented economic growth, especially in the United States. You had this enormous boom economically with great wealth. And the reason this happened is one, accidental, and the other one is social. The first is that America was the only country to survive World War II with its manufacturing capacity intact. Europe, Russia, Japan had all been devastated by the war. We had to spend billions to rebuild Europe through the Marshall Plan and many other kind of uh, forms of aid. So America was relatively untouched. We had Pearl Harbor, Pearl, Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, uh, and we also had some uh, minor fracas on the Aleutian Islands. But other than that, American soil was untouched and all of our factories were intact. That meant we became the factory to the world. Everybody else was going to need consumer goods. And we were perfectly poised to, you know, create them for them. So it was just a, a kind of happy accident of history. There's no other way to explain it. The second thing is, is that you have all these soldiers coming back, hundreds of thousands of soldiers, Many of them are newly empowered uh, because of the GI Bill to get educations, etc. And this likewise caused an economic boom. You have to realize the greatest generation had come through the Great Depression and World War II. That was an awful lot of adversity and scarcity. My parents were little kids during World War II, and even they remember, you know, ration books and not having, not being able to go on trips or not being able to have everything they want because it was all rationed. It was forced scarcity because of the war effort. So you have those people who have never known prosperity, and suddenly they get the opportunity at jobs and prosperity and consumer goods, and what's going to happen? They're going to snatch it up like that. They're going to indulge in it. Why wouldn't you? They were due. And it's funny because I sometimes think that the baby boomers look at their parents, the greatest generation, and see them as kind of shallow and materialistic. And I think that's really unfair. I think, you know, if you'd gone through 20 years of hardship and scarcity, you know, you'd want to take a vacation as well. Uh, and the boom made that possible. There's also something else that changes here too. And this is where we're going to get a little bit into uh, 
economics and culture. Uh, everybody's heard about planned obsolescence. I'm sure you've heard about planned obsolescence. This is this principle of design where a product is designed to break after just a few years and everybody gets planned obsolescence wrong. They all think that it's some nefarious plot by evil corporations to design cheap products to force people to keep coming back and buying new stuff. <laughs> actually, that's not true. Uh, it actually goes the opposite direction. In the post-war economy, manufacturers began to realize that people's purchasing habits had changed. Before the war, people generally bought for value. They wanted to buy things that were going to last. They didn't have a lot of money, and so they wanted to make sure they could spread that out as far as they could. So appliances, cars, things were expected to last 20 or more years. They were expected to be durable and practical. But after the war, they discovered that people were buying new products long before the old products had worn out. That every two years or so, they would upgrade their car, or upgrade their toaster, or their washing machine. And the reason they were doing it was not because the old one had worn out. They were doing it because the new one had a color that they liked, or it had new features. It had some kind of capacity that the old one didn't have. And so manufacturers realized that the thing that was motivating human um, consumption and consumer consumption was not necessity or need or value or durability or any of those things. It was choice. They just wanted something that matched their curtains or they wanted something that had a new bells and whistles or some kind of, you know, widget that would make their lives easier. People had enough disposable income that they could afford to make their purchases about choice. So companies changed. They changed their products. There was no sense in making a product last 20 years if the product was just going to be thrown away in five. So you make a product cheaper so you can sell more of it and so that you can keep people coming back by bringing on new features, new colors, new designs, and incremental improvements. And so consumerism went from something that was considered a negative. If you go back before World War II, consumption, the, consumer, the consumption of consumer goods was really seen as negative. It was seen as something that was uh, greedy or decadent. But afterwards, it was seen as valorous, as virtuous. It was something that you demonstrated your taste, you demonstrated your style, you demonstrated that you were hip to the times, that you had the latest thing. Uh, and so it created this kind of rat race, this keeping up with the Joneses, as we say in America, of everyone, you know, trying to have the latest thing or the newest thing, the thing that made them more comfortable or was a little bit more convenient or just a new color or just shiny and new design. And this world of rampant consumerism that is driven by choice, where you have this constant churn of consumer products, is the world we live in today. And I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Uh, I am up to my eyeballs in this world. And I like my smartphone. I like my TV. I have a TV that cost a fraction of what my dad paid for this gigantic old Curtis Mathis console we had as kids. And it's 10,000 times better. So I love all the new toys too. Um, but it does uh, come at a cost. There are real costs to this. The costs are a lot of this material good uh, piles up in our landfills uh, because we're constantly churning. Uh, a lot of these electronics require uh, rare earth metals. You have to mine those out of the ground, and that's not a pleasant process. That causes runoff and pollution. And that's even before we get to the fact that we have greater energy consumption, and greater energy consumption is greater carbon consumption, and that affects uh, climate change. So there are a lot of negative costs. And not the least of these is that it makes us feel like we're in a kind of materialist, indulgent, decadent culture. Now, there's a lot of positives, too. For one, because it's driven by choice and there's no end to the limit of human choice, it means that there's a capacity for endless growth. Uh, I always tell my graphic design students, you may not like it, but this consumer world is the world that created your industry. You know, you're constantly having design, new products, new user interfaces, etc., to accommodate all of these things. It's choice. We just want the new stuff. You know, when Apple comes out with a new product, people are lined up around the block to 
pick it up, even though it's only marginally different than the other one. And they'll have a new product six months from now, and that product will be dropped in price. <laughs> it's, it's, we just want it new. We, we like it, and there's no way to deny it. There are real ecological and kind of spiritual and social costs to it, but there's no denying it that we like the growth, we like the jobs that are produced by that growth, and we love our little trinkets and our products. And this is the world we've been living in since the post-World War II period. There's some evidence that that may be changing, uh, you know, that we're seeing smaller manufacturers, people using newer technologies to, to make things that are more environmentally friendly, etc., all of those kind of things. But the truth is we're still largely living in that post-war world. And uh, we shouldn't be hypocrites about it and acknowledge that, yeah, that's that's the reality of it. Uh, it does seem like a snake biting its own tail, but it wasn't uh, the companies that bit first. We bit first, you know. Craftsmanship didn't die. We killed it. Okay, that was a lecture. Oh my gosh. All right, well, that's just a way of setting up what life was like in the 50s and 60s. It was a time of incredible prosperity and incredible consumer choice on a level that no one had ever seen before. And this rise in consumerism and this creation of consumer products happens right at the time that modernism comes into its own. So right in the 50s and the 60s, when modernism as a design principle and modernism as an artistic principle comes around, that's when all these consumer goods come together. And modernism and consumerism fuse perfectly and completely. The corporate world absolutely, completely assimilates it 100%. Corporate buildings are rebuilt and as in modernist buildings. They are decorated with modernist paintings. Uh, you know, formica patterns, carpet patterns, wallpaper patterns are based on modernist art and abstract expressionist art. And this fuses into a kind of popular culture version of modernism. This has many names. Uh, it's been called Populux or Googie architecture. You can see it in the advertisements. You can see it in the buildings that exist. This is a diner. This is a famous Googie diner. This is in, I think, Los Angeles. Uh, this is ultimately the descendant of Bauhaus. Now, this is not what I think Gropius wanted or had in mind for his modernist principles, but it's completely abstract, walls of glass. It's completely modernist. I grew up in Las Vegas. Las Vegas has been remade since the 1990s, but when I was a kid, Las Vegas was a, uh, was a googie or modernist, uh, you know, uh, dream factory. You had all of these signs and stuff that were made from the 1960s. I remember the old school uh, Tomorrowland. They redid Tomorrowland in the 90s, but when I was a kid, it was all this, you know, googie architecture, populux. It was all this, you know, populist, modernist uh, art. If you remember the Jetsons, the Jetsons was that way. It was literally everywhere. Saul Bass was one of the greatest designers of the time. He designed logos for things like AT&T, but he also did movie posters. So even movie posters were examples of modernist design. Now, what does this mean? Well, remember that the avant-garde always defined itself in opposition to the establishment. It was there to challenge the status quo, but something very interesting had happened. The modernists won. They won. They had, were completely triumphant. Everything was modernist. And how can you challenge the establishment if you are the establishment? And so this left the avant-garde nowhere to go. Now, some people like Clement Greenberg were perfectly happy with that. That's what they fully expected, that this would be the style going forward. Modernism had a real sense of itself uh, and it was very, very triumphalist. It felt like, oh no, this is, we'll sweep away all the old styles and this will be the new style. And they often did that with, you know, terrible consequences. But you can see the germ, the beginning of the seeds of a counterculture emerge even in the late 1940s and 1950s. Uh, the Beatnik generation came along and they saw all this consumerism as empty and shallow. Now again, I think that's unfair of the baby boomers. Um, you know, when the Dadaists broke with the past, they were coming out of the horrors of World War I, the Spanish flu epidemic, the collapse of the Fimar Republic. You could kind of understand why they, they became nihilists. Uh, but the Beatnik generation, they became nihilists because of, you know, suburbs and Coca-Cola and McDonald's and mass consumerism. I think that, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, uh, thesis that it seems like 
uh, not only can adversity break a generation, but so can prosperity. Isn't that bizarre? That if you're very wealthy, uh, you, you look around your society and say, what is it all for? So I think they were kind of hard on their parents, but nevertheless, that's how they saw it. And there's more than a kernel of truth there that this was all kind of empty. It was uh, a materialist veneer that covered over some very dark things. Remember, the 1950s and 1960s was still the era um, of Jim Crow. The civil rights movement was in its infancy. It was still the era where most women uh, did not have equal access to either work or protection. It was an era of incredible sexism. And so you had these undercurrents, these countercultures recognizing that, yeah, it may look all shiny and pretty on the surface, but it ain't all that. And so you have a couple figures come by and come through. I'm, I'm highlighting a couple here, but there's literally dozens of these. I could put in Alan Capro and, and Jack Kerouac, who wrote On the Road. But two of the most important, I think, would be John Cage and Allen Ginsberg. John Cage is important because he founded the Black Mountain College in New York, uh, excuse me, in North Carolina, uh, which was really a radical college of the arts on all levels, music, theater, everything else. We'll come back and talk about him. But he also was one of these counterculturalists, these bohemians that was challenging the, gender, the, the establishment. And he was a musician by training. So he wrote a work of art we call uh, 433 or 4 minutes and 33 seconds. Now, I don't want to spoil this for anyone, so what I want you to do is go to YouTube, uh, Google uh, John Cage 433, find a performance of 433, and I want you to listen to it in its entirety, and then come back here. So hit the pause button, go listen to 433, come back here. All right, hopefully you've come back. Did that blow your mind? Yes, uh, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. <laughs> You can't get any more countercultural than that. That is just insane. So, I mean, as a piece of music, he completely destroys music by getting silence. Now, he was very into Zen philosophy. He liked the idea of the concept of the lacunae, the gap, the silence. And so he was very much trying to find something new. But that's how extreme some of these people were going against. Uh, Allen Ginsberg, for his part, uh, Allen Ginsberg was a poet. There you can see him in his hipster glasses. He was pretty much the original hipster. I think he actually coined the term. He was very critical of that culture and that society, too. And one of his most famous poems, Howl, uh, deals with the paradox and... and, and, uh, and contradictions of modern society and this kind of fake material society it has one of the best opening lines of poem uh, of poetry ever i saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness starving hysterical it's a fantastic line but the second howl has many parts and part two speaks a lot to architecture it's really kind of interesting uh he uses this metaphor known as moloch moloch is a demonic entity that people used to sacrifice children to. Uh, it's mentioned in the Bible. And he uses it as a metaphor for describing modern cities. He says things like, what sphinx of cement and aluminum bashed open their skulls and ate up their brains and imagination? Moloch, solitude, filth, ugliness, ash cans, and unobtainable dollars. Uh, listen to some of the phrases. I'm going to skip around here a bit. Uh, Moloch, the crossbone, soulless jailhouse and congress of sorrows. Moloch, whose buildings are judgment. Isn't that interesting? Moloch, whose mind is pure machinery. Moloch, whose blood is running money. Uh, and he goes on. Moloch, whose eyes are a thousand blind windows. Moloch, whose skyscrapers stand in the long streets like endless Jehovah's. Moloch, whose factories dream and belch and dream and croak in the frog in the fog moloch whose smokestacks and antenna crown the cities so it's clear that he's describing the kind of architecture that modernists were creating i mean you see these thousand blind windows what a better description of mies van der Rohe's glass boxes than that and these buildings were very efficient buildings to build but they also appealed to the modernist sense of this new future world, and they proliferated throughout all American cities. My dad's office, when I was a kid, was in a building that was clearly a clone of a Mies van der Rohe building. It looked just like the Seagram's building. And so what he's describing is that our cities had become soulless. They had been papered over. 
They'd lost their character. They'd lost their uh, uniqueness. And they'd been papered over by modernism. And that modernism was soulless. And that it was corporate. That it was capitalistic. Notice the references he makes to money and factories, etc. And so we see tensions building against the modernists. Against the, the modernists and their kind of triumphalism. And their, their view that everything should be subsumed in, in modernism. It, from a from a perspective of uh, historical preservation, this was very important too. That you start to see the phrase, the, the the cracking in the modernist movement in the early 1950s, but by the 60s it had completely boiled over, and the counterculture that was kind of just beneath the surface erupted into a full movement. One of the big things that happened really had to do with city planning and had we how we dealt with our cities. Uh, and you have people like Jane Jacobs writing this very famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, where she talks about how modernism was destroying our neighborhoods. Uh, Robert Moses is a character that if you don't know who he is, you really should become familiar with him. Uh, Robert Moses was never a governor or a mayor or anything like that, yet he was one of the most powerful people in New York City. He held a bunch of different positions from chairman of the Parks Commission uh, to chairman, chairman of the Parkway Authority. He held a whole variety of kind of bureaucratic positions, and he totally remade New York City, uh, bulldozing ethnic neighborhoods under the, the, the uh, claim that they were blight and replacing them with uh, vertical uh, projects based on principles of ideal cities by Cabousier. And he gutted the, the, the culture and the character of these cities. And so this was not just racist, it was, you know, uh, really kind of totalitarian in a way. It all came to a head for people when he decided, uh, he pushed for tearing down Penn Station. Penn Station was the principal railroad uh, station. I mean, you know, it was far bigger than Grand Station, uh, Grand, um, uh, uh, Grand Central Station in New York City today. Far bigger, far more luxurious. Uh, it was built by uh, McKim, Mead, and White as this kind of entry. It was actually based on Roman architecture, on Roman bathhouses. It's kind of interesting. And it had these enormous, you know, classical columns and facades. But they decided that it was taking up too much space, and they decided to tear it down, build it underground, and build Madison Square Garden on top of it. And many people protested it, but they didn't protest soon enough, and they lost it. And a lot of great architectural buildings got lost in this time period. And now New York is one of the most uh, stringent cities when it comes to historical preservation because of this, because they realize how much they lost. There's even a movement to rebuild part of Penn Station today to tear down Madison Square Garden. Uh, I don't know that that will ever happen. It's It's... It would be too difficult and too expensive. But a lot of people began to look at modernism askance and began to say, wait a minute, you say you're advancing things, you say you're doing this in the name of progress, and what you're really doing is you're destroying our cities, you're destroying our character, um, you're papering it over with this modernism, you're destroying ethnic neighborhoods. And it got really, really ugly. And uh, so you saw a lot of people begin to fight back. So that's the context of, of what was happening, that modernism had gotten all pervasive and all po powerful. It was just fused with the popular culture. And so how could you fight back? And so the way they fought back was a series of very radical ideas, at least in the arts. John Cage, for his part, is usually given credit for doing the first, for creating what was known as the first happening. Happening is a term that was created by uh, Alan Capro, who would organize these events. And what's interesting about these events is that there's really no way to describe them. They're not really works of art. They're not like theatrical performances. They're a strange mix of all of those. And the first one that actually happened was called Theater Piece Number no. 1. It happened in 1952. And... It was a bizarre thing. It happened at the Black Mountain College, but it was performed a few other places. Uh, and people had been used to some pretty radical things in theater. They had seen some non-narrative pieces, etc. Uh, but nothing like this. People sat down in the theater and then 
dancers came out onto the stage, but then danced up into the audience and started dancing through the rows. But the music was cacophony. There was no single piece of music. There were multiple pieces of music. Uh, people uh, came out into the audience and set up ladders in the middle of the audience and went up to the top of the ladder and sat down on the top of the ladder and began reading poetry. But they would all read the poetry simultaneously. Uh, so there was no rhyme or reason. There was no narration. There was no order. There was no stage direction. In fact, the people who did this didn't even have much direction themselves. They didn't even have instructions on when this should end or how this should end. At a certain point, the performance, such as it was, entered a kind of natural lull, and then one of the people on the stepladders got down, picked up a stepladder and walked off, and then pretty soon all the dancers and all the other people followed him. It wasn't even really planned, it just kind of happened. Um, it kind of had a natural evolution, it lasted about 20 to 30 minutes, and when the whole thing was over, the audience didn't even know to, if they were supposed to applaud. This was probably one of the first genuine pieces of performance art since the days of the Dadaists, and no one knew how to take it. Again, John Cage was very much into Zen Buddhism, this concept of nothingness. He wanted to represent the concept of nothingness or meaninglessness. He didn't want it to be narrative. He wanted to leave people confused, and that certainly succeeded. It was just bizarre. And behind all of it was a painting by Robert Rauschenberg. Rauschenberg uh, was very much involved with John Cage and his efforts, and he painted this. And many people could have been forgiven for thinking this was just a plain white backdrop because it's actually a painting, but it's one of his white paintings, which is just white on white, which is further than anybody had ever pushed uh, the extremes of painting before. So it shows that people were wanting to create something new, and they wanted to create something that was deliberately opposed to the consumerism or the perceived consumerism of modernism and its wedding to this corporate culture. And this really sparks off what we would call conceptual or performance art. Art that isn't based on what's there, it's based on what's not there. That is, even in modernism, even though modernism has this kind of performative aspect, when you look at a Jackson Pollock, you can see his rhythmic motions and the patterns of the paint. At the end of the day, modernism was focused on the object. At the end of the day, you have a big painting, and it's meant to hang in a gallery or a museum. It's focused on the object. But conceptual art and performance art moved it away from the object and moved it towards the artist, towards the audience and audience interaction. It moved it towards the moment and to the process. Uh, Yoko Ono said that the world has enough objects. And so her art was focused in that direction, away from the object to the experience. And so you see a use of a lot of techniques that were used in the Dadaist period, but recontextualized. Robert Rauschenberg did this performance called Pelican, where he went around with wheels and wings on, a, on roller skates. The thing about a performance or conceptual art in this way is that there's nothing left behind there's no object to own. And again, that itself was a kind of comment against the consumerism, because at the end of the day, when you made a big modernist painting like a Rothko or, or a Pollock, you had a huge painting, you could sell it for uh, tens of thousands of dollars, it was an asset. But if you made a performance, or you did something that was only fleeting, there was nothing to sell. So you weren't doing it for consumerism. How could you? There was nothing even left to sell. In fact, a lot of these artists had a hard time supporting themselves because they had nothing to sell. Alan Capra would organize these happenings where he would uh, build temporary structures out of blocks of ice in the middle of the summer. Uh, his fluids was one of the most famous one. And that one has been reperformed several times. Uh, but when you're done building some construction out of blocks of ice in the hot summer, eventually it just melts into a puddle and evaporates and it's gone. And that was part of the meaning of it. Also, that's something that was inspired by Zen Buddhism, this concept of nothingness, of samsara, the endless flow of life and death. I think perhaps one of the most important pieces of conceptual art uh, in this early period has to be this. This is an erased de Kooning. 
Now, Robert Rauschenberg was one of these young whippersnappers that was hanging around the New York school in the 1940s and 1930s. Uh, he was kind of a closeted gay man and was not open about it. Uh, and he recognized that, you know, he really was on the outs with these, you know, kind of very heterosexual, <laughs> hard drinking, uh, you know, guys, but he admired the heck out of them. Uh, and he often said that he wasn't a threat to them, that they, they never considered him much of an artist, and so therefore he wasn't a threat. So therefore he was allowed to be a groupie and hanger on in this group. And he was working on his white paintings, and he was trying to push paintings into what he described as the all-whites to deal with composition that was nothing but pure emptiness. Again, building on these ideas of emptiness and, and nothingness. And he started by erasing his own drawings, with the idea that, you know, okay, I'll create something and then I'll erase it. And that way, it, the, the, the lack, the emptiness is what's there. Uh, but he realized, he thought to himself, you know, the problem is I'm not a good enough artist. You know, I could erase a, a Rauschenberg, but that's just an erased Rauschenberg. I have to get a better artist and erase his picture in order to create this sense of what's lost. And it's kind of crazy to think that way. So he idolized de Kooning, and so he decided, well, I'll go ask de Kooning for a drawing, and I'll ask him to uh, erase it. Now, de Kooning was an angry drunk and a very obstreperous, uh, cantankerous guy. Uh, one would expect him to just really be angry and, you know, pop uh, Rauschenberg in the face and say, no, you crazy hippie, get out of here. Uh, but that's not what happened. Uh, instead, he showed, up at, uh, he showed up at de Kooning's studio, and he, he came with a, a bottle of Jack Daniels, always a good way to, to get in on uh, uh, the good side of, uh, of uh, de Kooning. And he sat him down and he explained the idea to him. And de Kooning listened patiently and he said, well, I'm against it. I'm, I, you know, and he thought, oh, crap. OK, well, he's not going to go for it. And so Robert Rauschenberg said, OK, well, you know, what I'll do is I'll make that the work. I'll, you know, he, I, I'll, I'll make a, a conceptual piece where I asked de Kooning for a work and he refused, and that becomes the work. But de Kooning surprised him and said, well, I'm going to give you something I'm, I'm, I'm really going to miss. And, and Rauschenberg was stunned. And he came out with uh, a drawing. He said, I want to give you something that's really hard to erase so that he earns it. And he came out with a drawing and the drawing had pencil and graphite and charcoal and oil pastels and a bunch of other things. And, and Rauschenberg was just kind of shocked, but he took the drawing and he said he spent a month erasing that drawing, getting it back to the blank paper. And then he displayed this in a gallery and people were shocked because the, the, you took, you know, one of the greatest artists of the abstract expressionist period and you destroyed his work it was like an act of vandalism and he resisted those things he says you know everybody thought that it was an act of vandalism that it was a kind of protest and he said but to me it was poetry that's what i was i was doing it was something that was there that's no longer there and of course there's a drawing on the opposite side that's sealed away so the documentation is built in as he said but if you think about it this is a drawing that is missing. We have lost this work by this master. And the only people who've ever laid eyes on it are Rauschenberg and de Kooning. And so therefore, it is this sense of loss, the, the missing. It's a work of art that doesn't make sense except on its conceptual level. Because there's nothing to look at. There's nothing there. It's gone. It's lost. Everything that he could possibly erase, he erased. So what we're left with is nothingness. And it's these kind of ideas. This is a real shift. I, I want to really emphasize this. This is a non-object. I mean, there's still a piece of paper there with little traces of stuff from the erased drawing. But it's a non-object. There's nothing left. What makes this art is not the object. It is the concept behind the object. And so we see a real shift at this time away from the object. Even though, you know, when you think about abstract expressionist art, it's pretty conceptual that you're losing yourself in this rhythmic motion. You come up with a technique, whether it's a color field or a zip or a drip or whatever it is. You come up with a technique that removes the artist and comes up with some pure expression. But even at the end of that, you have a painting. You have something you can sell. <laughs> you have something you can put on a wall. 
uh, that's the object. It's, it's still object focused, but we're moving away from the object to the concept. The concept becomes the work of art. And it's a huge fundamental shift that we see at this time period. And it really is a way to keep the avant-garde independent and to keep it fighting against the establishment, against this kind of assimilation of the establishment. So the first real organized movement that starts kind of pulling itself together uh, comes around a, a, a art critic uh, by the name of Restini, who was a French art critic. And he had a few artists around him that he was seeing the kind of work they were doing. These were all European artists. And they wrote a manifesto, and the manifesto is ridiculously short. Uh, it says, the nouveau realists have become conscious of their collective identity. Nouveau realism equals new perceptions of the real. And this was a kind of an interesting statement, and you can see that they all signed it. Uh, the manifesto itself was a work of art. It wasn't like a printed document. It was a painted blue canvas with white letters on it. <laughs> and there it is. So it is itself a work of art. And these people were called neo-Dadaists at the time because the things that they were doing were very similar to what the Dadaists were doing. And they were very clearly anti-consumerists. For most of them, these were Europeans that were living in the wake of this huge explosion of American prosperity, which also brought a wave of consumer goods. Uh, you know, France really got hammered by the war and needed the Marshall Plan to rebuild. But, you know, no uh, welfare program ever goes uncorrupted. Uh, and so while the Marshall Plan did pay to rebuild France, and they were very grateful for that, it came with uh, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, hooks and uh, secret clauses. And that is that it meant that, you know, hey, if America was going to bail you out, we got access to European markets, which means that you had to accept American products like Coca-Cola and everything else. And so it represented this tidal wave of American uh, crass commercial culture coming into Europe. And a lot of Europeans resisted it. They resisted it. So it became a deliberately anti-consumerist, you know, kind of movement. And you can see that in the things that they put together. Uh, Jean Tingley, for example, made his homage to New York, which is one of the more surprising pieces. It was a collection of machines that were designed to destroy themselves. Uh, you know, it had bursts of smokes and fireworks. You know, he started up the machine, but at the end of it, the machines would just kind of continue into repetitive motions or flailing motions until they literally ripped themselves apart. There's only a few small pieces that are still around today couldn't have a better metaphor for what they thought of modern society, that modern society was mechanistic, but it was fundamentally tearing itself apart. Uh, Daniel Spurry, for example, would do similar things. He would do what he called his snare pictures, where he would gather the detritus of a meal. People would sit down to a meal, and he would gather the unfinished uh, food and the empty plates and put them together into these kind of tableaus, uh, showing the consumption of the food and showing uh, the loss of it uh, and what a better way to kind of be an anti-consumerist message to show well, you know the consumption that existed in society perhaps the most important of all of these uh, people who was part of this movement was Yves Klein. Yves Klein is one of my favorite uh, uh, French uh, artists who was both a, a painter and a conceptualist he would paint these seemingly very modernist pieces, but they were different. Instead of being fields of color, they were uniformly flat. So you didn't even get the resonance or the brushwork or the soft tonalities of a Rothko or another. They were just flat paint. He even patented his own color uh, called Yves Klein Blue, uh, which was this particular color. And the fact that he patented it and made it a commercial product that you could still get, by the way, it's still it's still a recognized copyright. Uh, it's still a recognized copyrighted, uh, you know, color. Uh, it's really interesting how he experimented with that, uh, turning a, a, a painting into a kind of product. One of my favorite examples is that 
Uh, every once in a while, I'll run into somebody who says, well, contemporary art has gotten so crazy. One day I'm going to put up a gallery and I'm not going to put anything in it. And I go, eh, sorry to break it to you, but that already happened. Uh, you know, <laughs> it happened more than, uh, it happened more than 70 years ago. <laughs> uh, uh, not quite 70 years ago, close to 60 years ago. Uh, and it happened by, uh, Yves Klein. Yves Klein actually put together a gallery and in that gallery, he had nothing but empty spaces. Here you can see him standing next to, uh, the place where a painting was to, he put these vitrines or glass cases or little tiny pedestals where you would put sculptures or works of art and there was nothing in them. And this was called collectively the void or the specialization of sensibility of the raw material state into stabilized pictorial sensibility, uh, which is a pretentious title, of course. And what he was saying is, you know, a lot of art is context. You know, if you put a work of art on a pedestal or in a glass case or on a wall in a gallery, then it automatically gets interpreted as art. And of course, some some merry tricksters these days have actually done stuff like this. Some people have, you know, snuck random objects into galleries. And, you know, there's a famous one where a group of people took off glasses and set the glasses in the middle of the floor in a modern gallery. And people were taking photos of it and gathering around it because they assumed that it was a work of art in the gallery. But this idea of framing your concept of making it obvious to you that what makes art art is the context and the setting as much as it is the art itself. He was also some of the first to experiment with performance art. He was very uh, well known for this anthropometry series where he would sometimes paint women, sometimes chimps with his patented blue color and then have them press themselves against canvases or splash themselves across canvases. But at the end, the canvases were just a record of the event. The actual event itself was what was the performance, was the work of art. He would even bring a chamber orchestra in and people would attend and watch the performance to make it happen. He even was uh, a bit of a trickster himself. He would uh, create kind of composite photographs. This one was a composite photograph. Uh, he was a r really into Kung Fu and martial arts. And Kung Fu makes a lot of promises about, you know, if you get to the higher levels, you have almost supernatural abilities. Uh, this is before Bruce Lee. This is before Kung Fu movies broke through and were really big. But there was this fascination with it. And so he claimed that it gave him this ability to levitate or fly. So he staged this photo where he leaped from a building. Now, in reality, uh, this is a composite photo they put together with him in an empty street. Underneath him were a couple of his friends with a blanket ready to catch him. Uh, but he staged this photograph to this leap into the void. And his persona created this kind of fake uh, alter ego of him being almost this kind of supernatural martial arts expert. It's kind of bizarre. And you see that one of the things that happens is the artist is no longer separate from the art. You know, when Jackson Pollock was done with a painting, he was done with a painting and he picked up a bottle of Jack Daniels and went and, you know, hung out with his friends at the Cedar Tavern and drank and was an ordinary Joe. But for a lot of these conceptual artists, you never stopped being an artist. You were always an artist. Uh, one of the more fun uh, examples of this is Piero Manzoni, who was an Italian artist who was part of the Arte Povera movement, movement in Italy. He first made his career by signing these models, these living sculptures. Again, these are actual live models. These aren't mannequins. These are real women. In fact, uh, somebody once told me the story about how they met one of these living art, uh, living sculptures at a cocktail party. Uh, you know, she was a 60 year old lady by then, uh, but at the time she was a young model and she had a certificate that proved that she was one of Manzoni's living sculptures. Again, this is, what is it that makes a work of art a work of art? Is it the context or is it the actual manufacturer? I mean, you know, these are living women or works of art because Piero Manzoni signed them. It's the artist that makes them works of art. He, he would play with this same theory with some of these uh, magic bases that he would make. Again, you put a work of art on a pedestal in a gallery, everybody knows it's a work of art. So what he would do is he would make these things that he called magic bases, and he would stand upon them or have other people stand upon them. And so you were on the base, you became a work of art. My favorite example of this is he actually took one of these magic bases and turned it upside down. 
So again, if you think, and this becomes the base of the world. So you know, if you think about it, the reason this is upside down is because if you turn upside down from that perspective, it's not on the earth, the earth is on it. So congratulations, if you live on the earth, you live on a work of art because Pierre Manzoni made it a work of art. Again, it's the concept that makes this, not the object. And then, of course, this this ultimately comes into one of the most absurd examples, uh, artists' shit. Uh, excuse my language, but that's exactly uh, what it is. He actually took cans and purportedly canned his own fecal matter, and then he signed these and individually numbered them. Even, you know, commissioned pictures of himself looking at them the same way that <laughs> the same way that an artist would contemplate their own work of art and here he is coming out of the bathroom with a can of his fecal matter as if this is his studio now i have heard two stories and i'll share them both with you because i don't know which one is true i have heard curators tell me it was all bs uh he never did can his fecal matter he just you know canned something else it was all a gag and it never was serious and what he was doing was he was making a a case that you know it is the artist's intent you know i mean here's fecal matter something you know crap something you produce and if the artist is somebody who produces something then if i decide i sign my name to it then it's art and this is meant to be deliberately provocative and funny if you think this is shocking or ridiculous congratulations that's the point so it was all just a gag it was a, a farce but I have also heard from other people that said, oh, no, it's real. And the reason they know is because the cans, uh, you know, canned goods really are only supposed to last a few years. And these cans are now um, rusting away and uh, they're they're turning into a biohazard. So I don't know which of those is true. I have heard both of those. So either way, it doesn't really matter because it's the concept that makes the thing what it is. It is the concept that matters, not the object. Which brings us to pop art. Pop art, in my opinion, really is a kind of subset of conceptual art. In that it really only works, again, on this sensation of that you're not focused on the object, you're focused on the concept. Pop art is different than a lot of conceptual art, because a lot of conceptual art, there is no object, or the object is a construct that only really works because you accept it, you know, like the name of the artist on a, on a living person turns that person into a sculpture or an erased de Kooning turns it into you know, an object. Uh, but pop art, even though it did produce paintings and things that could be sold, uh, which is an important point for why it was so successful, it still relies on a concept. And it makes sense that we would ultimately go to popular culture for a source of inspiration. That is, every culture since the beginning of time has always looked to its own popular culture for inspiration. That's not new. What's different is that the pop artists recognized that popular culture was the dominant culture. And boy, is this true more than ever. We live in the golden age of geeks and nerds. You know, I hate to break it to you, but when I was a kid, uh, admitting liking Lord of the Rings or Doctor Who was enough to get you shoved in your locker or get a swirly. If you don't know what a swirly is, look it up. I got one. Uh, and that's not true today. All of those things are, future, are features of popular culture, and they're just everywhere. I'll never forget the, the year that my oldest daughter came and asked my son to teach her Dungeons and Dragons so she could go hang out with the cute boys who were doing Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, what fantasy universe, what alternate dimension have I slipped into? That was not the universe I grew up in. So we live in the golden age of geeks where we embrace pop culture, we just revel in it. But it was the era of the pop artist that realized that pop culture really was the predominant and prevailing culture of society. Now, unlike the nouveau realists who really were anti-consumerists, pop culture has a much more nuanced view to it. Because again, most of the pop culturists, uh, pop artists were in fact, um, most of the pop artists were American. And America has a, a kind of, you know, if you're 
a European culture and you're having this pop culture being forced on you, then you're going to have a different attitude than if you're the culture that's producing it. And sometimes it's anti-consumerist and sometimes it's not. It draws its inspiration from advertising, from mass production materialism, uh, and it deals in semiotics and signs. Remember that semiotics just means symbols, images, etc. Remember that up until this point, abstraction had dominated, and so signs, figuration, these things were passé. And so when people started introducing imagery back into art, it was really a shock. People didn't know what to do with it. And so they started calling these people realists because they were doing things that were real, but it was not a realism that existed as before. I think one of the genius of the pop artist is that a lot of modernism was spent looking for a new visual vocabulary. That's what the Surrealists were all about. We need to find a new visual vocabulary, and they found it in the works of Freud. That the old visual vocabularies of Christianity and classicism were long since dead, and we needed a visual, new visual vocabulary, and so they were trying to create one. Abstraction itself was an attempt to create a new visual culture, a new visual vocabulary. But the pop artists recognized, we don't need to create a new visual vocabulary. We, we shouldn't have to strive to find a universal visual vocabulary because it already exists. We invented it without even trying to, and that was pop culture, mass media, mass advertising. One of the first pop uh, art works it's going to be this work by Richard Hamilton. And I love the title of it because the title, again, is ripped directly from advertising. Just what is it that makes today's home so different, so appealing? Everything in this is collage. When people started seeing this, they started calling it Neo-Dada because, remember, collage, non-traditional materials, these were features of Dadaism. Uh, and everything here is ripped from something in mass media. We have uh, advertisements for vacuum cleaners, a Tootsie Pop. We have uh, figures from pornography, uh, canned ham. I love that this carpet here looks like it's based on an abstract expressionist pattern. Notice that on the wall we have comics. Comics were mass-produced items at the time. This is a romance comic. Little tidbit for people who are in the, to, uh, the history of comic books. We all think of comic books as superheroes, but that's actually a Silver Age comic fixation. Golden Age comics kind of ended with the with World War II and people moved on to other things. And they liked war comics or true crime comics or romance comics. These were like soap operas in print and they were just as popular amongst adults as anybody else. Far more popular. We have logos from Ford. All of these mass produced things uh, contrived and put together into an environment to make us think about what it is that we are consuming. I think this could be looked at as anti-consumerist, but I think it's more just this is the world we live in, that our world is saturated with this stuff. Robert Rauschenberg, for his part, in addition to being one of these people who advanced um, conceptual art, was also pushing the boundaries of pop art by the introduction of non-traditional materials. Early on, he was painting paintings that were more or less abstract expressionist paintings, but this painting actually spills out onto the chair and brings the painting out into the third dimension. Probably the most famous example of this is where he took his own bed and set it up and started splashing paint on the surface of it. And the paint and the treatment of the paint is very much like an abstract expressionist would paint. But putting it on a recognizable object, his own bed, transforms this from an abstract expressionist piece into a kind of conceptual piece. He continued with this idea, creating a number of works that he called combines. And these were, again, assemblages of a variety of materials. He loved taxidermy models. He would go to uh, kind of flea markets and find all kinds of taxidermy chickens and other things and incorporate them in things. He would paint over newsprint or other items. One of my favorite uh, examples of this is his odalesque. His odalesque is itself uh, a combination of a chicken coop, uh, a taxidermy chicken, a column that has been mounted to a base through a pillow. 
So there's so many subtle metaphors here. And then the chicken coop is covered in all kinds of clipper, clippings and prints, many of them which are you know, postcards of works of art. The name odalisk here is itself a kind of a pun. Uh, an odalisk is, an odalesque is a female nude, much like the grand odalesque by Ong. But an obelisk is an upright, you know, kind of monument. And so he's combining these two spellings to create something that is a monument, and also, you know, including these references to monumental nudes. But his monument is a very strange monument. It's mounted on a pillow. It doesn't have a stable base. We think of monuments as something being stable, as permanent. And instead, he's given us something that is impermanent, something that is contrary, something that combines these things. Now, again, a nude figure is a kind of monument of art. And he is really attacking that concept of monumentality and taking ephemeral things, waste, you know, cast-offs, and elevating them to the status of art. Very similar in his approach is Jasper Johns. Jasper Johns was one of the, the first pop artists, and he was noted, of course, for making these uh, in, uh, flags. These flags are painted in encaustic. Encaustic is a wax-based paint. Wax is, you know, very old technique. Encaustic is an old technique. But he would paint these flags over again newspaper. So when you see a detail, underneath all of these flags are ripped up pieces of newspaper. So there becomes a subtext here. The flag is a symbol of our country, but the newsprint is a symbol of our kind of ephemeral culture. The whole point of the newspaper clippings and other things is that you throw them away. They're impermanent. We think of countries and nations and flags and symbols of nations being permanent, but he's combining impermanent things with permanent things. One of the other features of the pop artists is repetition. I know that we'll see this when we get to Andy Warhol, but you especially see it in Jasper Johns in early works that he would repeat motifs. And again, that's a kind of message, a meta message, just like the newsprint is a kind of meta message underneath the subtext of you know, the larger symbol of the American flag, the repetition of the flag is a meta message. Why is the American flag so recognizable? Why does it have instant, you know, recognition? If you're American, I hope you realize this, if you're not American, Americans are really into their flag. <laughs> no one else in the world I know is quite into their flag the way Americans are. We're really hung up about it. It becomes an emblem of our country, of patriotism. Uh, you see it everywhere. Uh, I've heard friends of mine who are Europeans saying, wow, you people are really hung up on your flags. Europeans tend to get their flags out for special holidays or soccer matches, and that's about it. But Americans, the flags are just a kind of ubiquitous symbol. It's the same thing with Texas. Texas is really into the shape of their state. They have cutouts of their state on their houses and other things. So these icons are just really important. And so what he's saying is it's the repetition of the image, it's the repetition of it that makes it so powerful, that gives it such resonance. It's not just that there's one flag, it's that there's many flags. There's this principle in economics called scarcity where the thing that makes something valuable is that there's only so many of it. The reason the Mona Lisa is so valuable is because there's only one of it. But there's another way to think of images as well, and that's ubiquity. And that is something gains value if we can all recognize it. You know, it gives you a sense of comfort. It immediately connects with you, and so you know it's important. And that's what they're playing on here. So you have this kind of strange balance between something that is intentionally disposable, but also has value because it's immediately recognizable. That's when we get to this wonderful uh, sculpture. This is um, a sculpture of two Ballantine uh, ale cans. So Ballantine was one of the first uh, brands of beer to have be canned in, uh, in had to be uh, canned in actual cans. Most beer was in bottles at this time, so this itself was kind of a you know a technological marvel. But the cans were fully disposable. The whole point of a beer can is you're just to toss it and throw it away, and it's made out of a cheap material, aluminum, uh, and then it usually has some printed or cheap label. But these are made in bronze. Bronze is a prestigious metal. Bronze is a material that 
uh, indicates permanence. And the labels here, rather than being mass produced, are hand painted. So think about that. That's a head scratcher. Jasper Johns here is taking stuff that was meant to be impermanent, ephemeral, thrown away, tossed off, and he's rendering it in oil paint by hand and rendering it in bronze. He's rendering it out in durable, prestigious materials. It's the complete opposite of what the, the originals are. And that's the kind of commentary. You know, you elevate the ephemeral. Probably one of the most uh, famous of the pop artists uh, for that same reason is Roy Lichtenstein, is that he elevated the ephemeral. He's most noted for taking comic books. This was one of the first ones that he did. Uh, comic books, of course, oh gosh, it's really hard to talk about comic books in this day and age because, uh, I hate to break it to you, but comic books are dead. <laughs> if you look at a comic book today, if it has a circulation of 25,000, that's big. That's a successful comic. Uh, a circulation of 25,000, you know, in the 1960s or 70s, they'd have dropped that comic like that. They had circulations of 100,000 or more, and some of these got circulation up to about a half a million. Uh, comics were mainstream. Everybody read them. There were romance comics and horror comics and true comics for adults, and of course the superhero stuff for kids and everything else. And they really were mainstream and mass-produced. You know, they weren't nearly the niche market that we are today. Uh, so I hate to break it to you, but yeah, the age of comics died. And it probably died sometime in the 90s. It's been trailing off ever since. Um, who knows if DC and Marvel comics will even survive. Marvel is going to survive because of the movies and because of Disney. But the comics itself are, are quite frankly, kind of struggling. Uh, they've lost their, their audience. And so when you look at these comics, you know, we live in a world where, you know, comics are you know, comic movies or, you know, multi-billion dollar things, but they weren't back then. And so to take something like a comic and elevate it to art was really a scandal. He also would take, you know, kind of romance comics. His favorite were romance comics, and he would elevate them. Now, the funny thing is he was a terrible plagiarist. <laughs> he would copy some of the most famous artists of the day, including um, uh, John Romita and Jack Kirby and some of the greatest comic book artists of the day and he would take these panels that were only a couple inches wide and he would blow them up to eight feet across and he would just flat out trace them but he was kind of an incompetent uh, tracer and he didn't really care to he actually accentuated the 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 bad lines of them I don't know how to express this he, if you see the originals that he's basing this on the artists were in many ways better artists. And so what he was doing is he was emphasizing the artificiality or the fakeness of it. By singling it out and elevating it to this level, uh, he was highlighting the fakeness of it. Uh, and the copying aspect of it was part of the form. Many comic book artists really resent uh, Lichtenstein for his uh, grotesque copying of their works, but the nature of that is that if you recontextualize something, it becomes uh, new work to the artist. It's kind of a frustrating reality of it. One of my favorite pop artists is going to be James Rosenquist. James Rosenquist, what's interesting about a lot of these pop artists is so many of them started in the field of commercial art. James Rosenquist got his start as a billboard painter. Now, today, billboards are mass printed. Heck, some of them are LEDs. But back in that day, every single billboard had to be painted by hand, and they were painted in large panels. So, you know, it's impossible to get a single canvas 40 feet long and, you know, 10 feet high. So what you would do is you would break that up into multiple panels, and then those panels could be loaded on a truck, and then they would be assembled. And so you really had to be quick. You had to be good. To do that because a new ad would come in every month and you would take the panels down and reassemble them and you would reuse the panels you would paint over the panels and paint on top of the panels and sometimes the panels would be jumbled up from the original and as he was doing this he noticed that there was a, a kind of odd uh, series of contradictions that ads for uh, cake or cars would get mixed up with others and then you'd whitewash the whole thing and paint new things on it, and there were these odd juxtapositions of commercial products. 
So he used the skills that he had developed as a billboard painter and started creating works like this in almost the exact same technique using large single panels to break it up. But here you can see, this is president-elect, uh, here you can see uh, the face of JFK, but he's mixed with, you know, the, <laughs> the chrome, uh, you know, hubcap of a car and obviously a commercial for moist cake. And it connects these three things together that despite one of them being politics and one of them being, you know, cake and one of them being a car, all of them were treated as consumer goods. JFK is often, mark, is often remarked that he was the first uh, president to be marketed almost like a product. Now, of course, all the candidates are marketed like products, uh, you know, but at the time that was really kind of revolutionary. Uh, and so this was, again, Rosenquist's way of saying, you know, all of our life, even our politics, have been saturated with this kind of imagery. Uh, by far the most uh, amazing image he did is a whole series of these panels that he did for a painting called F-111. This is in the, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and it's impossible to get a sense of it because it wraps around you know, four walls in, an, uh, in a whole gallery. It just takes up the whole gallery. So this panorama gives you a sense of what it was like, and here are the individual pieces. But again, it's a, such a strange picture because all through the background, we have the F-111. The F-111 was, of course, uh, one of the great, uh, uh, you know, planes of America's, you know, military empire at the time. It was a kind of strange plane, halfway to a bomber, halfway to a fighter, but it became one of the, the workhorses of the Vietnam conflict. And this was right as the Vietnam conflict was heating up. But you'll notice that that plane is only barely visible behind an array of other images. Again, cake, tires, light bulbs, a hair dryer. Notice the hair dryer has a kind of modernist aesthetic to it that's very similar to the silver nose cone and fairing of the F-111. We also have spaghetti and an umbrella, and under the umbrella, a nuclear cloud. Uh, Rosenquist wasn't shy about making the connection between America's consumer culture and America's military-industrial complex. I know it sounds almost hokey to say that today. Uh, military-industrial complex is a phrase that was invented by General Eisenhower. Uh, General Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, excuse me, when he was president, he gave a farewell address and he gave a warning to the country that the Cold War had forced a reality on America that had never existed before. America had never had massive standing armies or massive military presence up until uh, the post-war period. Generally, America would uh, quickly tool up. They would uh, draft a bunch of people, uh, get a get an army together, and then once the war was over, that army would disband and you'd have a very small standing army. But the nature of the Cold War was such that um, instant death could be rained down on us by the Russians. And so there was a state of kind of paranoia and fear that existed, and this sparked off the arms race. And that put America on a permanent war footing that you never could kind of uh, you know, kind of demilitarize. You were constantly militarizing. And Eisenhower recognized that this military was being funded by corporations. Uh, this military, it was the consumer society that gave us the wealth to afford the greatest military in the world in the first place. And then it was those same corporations that would turn around and produce the products that would be used in those wars, the weapons, the planes, the tanks, uh, the guns, all of those weapons. So there was no separating out this consumerist culture from the larger uh, military culture. And of course, there's a perverse, perverse incentive here. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard the stories of, of Pentagon acquisitions where we spent billions for a weapon that we didn't need because we're in this state where we feel like we need to be armed and the industries, of course, are going to be pushing for these military acquisitions because it benefits their bottom line. And it could become quite sinister. And I think what James Rosenquist is doing here is he's saying, you know, all of this kind of expansion of American consumerist culture is intricately linked to its military culture and still is today.
I'm getting kind of political. I shouldn't get so political. Uh, the truth of the matter is that all the nations in the world are kind of caught up in this same trap uh, that we exist in. And it's interesting how he contrasts the consumer goods with uh, the F-111, this kind of pinnacle of uh, American uh, military technology. It's really, it's, I love this painting because it's beautiful on one level, but it's also just kind of uh, really uh, kind of scary on another. And then we have people like Klaus Oldenburg, who was pushing in other directions, but again, he was pioneering in a new direction. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about sculpture is sculpture is supposed to be hard. Sculpture is made out of bronze, marble, hard, permanent things. And he started taking and making sculptures that were soft out of cloth and vinyl. And he also started making sculptures that, again, were not of big, important, epic kind of subjects, but were about smaller things, consumer goods, hamburgers, or light switches. So drawing our attention to the, the everyday facets of life. Now, all of these pop artists were really exploring popular culture. That is, they were taking popular culture as their source material, but they were still crafting and making objects in much the same way that an artist had been for centuries, by creating them. They were still, even though moving in the direction of concept, hung up on the object itself as the kind of source of creation. And there's one artist in particular that, of all the pop artists, that's different, and that is quite revolutionary. And that's going to be Andy Warhol. Now, Andy Warhol is different because, gosh, how do I say this? All of the other pop artists were mining popular culture for their material. That is, what made them pop artists was their subject matter. But Rosenquist is still painting all of those paintings by hand. Klaus Oldenburg is still making those soft sculptures when he got help and assistance, but he was making them themselves. Lichtenstein is blowing up those pictures and tracing them on the wall, but he's still at least tracing them. That is, all of the pop artists are still involved in a kind of hands-on creation of the object, the way artists had been doing things for centuries. And they were still thought of themselves as artists, that the point of an artist is to create an object. The subject matter was pop culture, but they themselves were still very much artists. Andy Warhol is different. Andy Warhol didn't want to create works of art that were drawn from pop culture. He wanted to become a feature of pop culture himself. You know, the other artists wanted to make art. Andy Warhol wanted to become an adjective. He wanted to fully embrace this. And that shows in his work. I think you'll see what we mean as we go along. So let's just dive right into this. So Andy Warhol was born outside uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, and he was born to an immigrant family, and he was a Ruthenian Catholic. Uh, the Ruthenians uh, accept the Pope, but their liturgy, that is their day-to-day -day rites uh, in church, are based more on Eastern Orthodox kind of rituals, which means they use icons in their worship. That's going to be important. And he remained a devout Catholic his entire life. Uh, it's interesting that he actually had an audience with Pope John Paul II, and he regarded that as one of the most uh, important moments of his life. Uh, and he was devoted to his mother, and he went to Mass every day. Uh, it's kind of fascinating, because you wouldn't think Andy Warhol would be this devout Catholic, uh, but many other artists have come forward and said, you know, when I was lost in my life and because of drugs, etc., he said, have you considered the church? And he actually converted a few people to Catholicism. It's not the image we have of Andy Warhol. We have this image of him being this kind of openly gay, bohemian character, 
uh, you know, this uh, absolutely, you know, outrageous avant-garde character living in New York City. Uh, but he was. And that's actually going to be important to understanding his character, that he understood images. Images were part of his upbringing. If you are raised Ruthenian Catholic, as he was, he would go to church every day, he would attend masses, the masses would have icons of the saints. And so he understood semiotics, he understood signs and images and symbols. And his artwork reflects that. He actually was a very successful commercial illustrator. He actually did things like greeting cards and also children's illustration. Here are some of examples of his early illustrations. And you can see that they have this very nice uh, refined uh, aesthetic, this kind of pared down minimalist aesthetic that fit in perfectly with the kind of modernist ideals of the time. I love this little illustration of the the woman in her wonderful little party dress out in front of the typical 1950s style car. And he was very, very successful as this uh, commercial illustrator, but he was thinking about images in this way, and it's, this is when he begins to create the first paintings. Now, he initially started out creating paintings based on comic books, uh, and he was uh, submitting these to galleries, but the one gallery that he submitted to had already accepted works based on comic books by Liechtenstein. So he was kind of beat to the punch. Uh, Liechtenstein had kind of claimed that territory. So he decided to go to other areas, and where he decided to go was to advertising. He was fascinated by advertising, that here was an image that was printed in a newspaper, and you could look at it, and someone else clear across town could be looking at that same image. That image would somehow connect you. The ads were ubiquitous. It was this quality of ubiquity. Scarcity, there's only one image, that's what makes it valuable, but ubiquity means that everybody knows it and everybody recognizes it. And this is certainly a principle he would have recognized from his childhood and his upbringing, because the image of a saint in one church looks exactly like the image of a saint in another church. There's a recognizable iconography. You share something across that space and time because it's something that you both recognize. And it's clear that he recognized that mass-produced images, commercial images, had created a new iconography for Americans. That these mass media has become the new visual language. And so he turned his attention to ads, and he would replicate these ads by blowing these ads up using an opaque projector and just tracing over them and painting them on the wall. So here was an early hand-painted piece uh, that he did based on a doctor, you know, uh, giving uh, nose jobs, uh, rhinoplasty. He also did the same thing for Coca-Cola. Uh, Coca-Cola was uh, something that he absolutely loved. He loved brand names because they were so recognizable. And he thought there was something equalizing in the brands. He said about Coca-Cola, he said, you know, you can't get a fancy Coca-Cola. You can't, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the Pope, the president. If you drink a Coke, it's the same Coke everywhere. It's not like wine where there's this, you know, distinctions of it. You can't buy a fancy bottle of Coke. There's something that we all share because of that. So he was projecting these on the wall and he was tracing them by hand and painting them by hand. And this wasn't good enough for him because... He didn't just want to paint pop cultural items. Like the other painters like Rosenquist and Lichtenstein and others were content to paint pop cultural uh, you know, features. They wanted to take it as subject matter and recontextualize it in art. But he wanted to go one step further. He wanted to reproduce art in the same way that the original advertising was produced. So he got introduced to silk screening. Silk screening was the way that uh, a lot of mass-produced uh, items were printed. Books, cartons, boxes, packaging, labels of all kind were mass-produced in the silk screening process. The way the silk screening process works is you have a silk screen for every single color separation and instead of painting it on by hand, you take a big squeegee and you run that color over that silk screen and wherever uh, that silk screen uh, allows the color to go through, it's produced. So it's a very mechanist mechanistic 
part of reproduction. And he wanted to replicate that. He didn't want to paint a mass-produced item by hand. He wanted to paint a mass-produced object in the same way as the mass-produced object. He wanted to destroy the distinction of between art and mass-produced objects. That's a very important distinction. I know I've hammered this before, but let me say this once more. Let me really get into the nitty-gritty here. All the other artists wanted to use pop culture as a source material to make comments on pop culture. Andy Warhol wanted to make art pop culture itself. He wanted it to have the same kind of qualities of pop culture and mass media. And to this end, he produced his first series, his 32 Campbell soup cans. There were th Why 32? Because there were 32 varieties of Campbell soup at the time. And so he decided to make a print based on all 32 varieties of Campbell's soup. Now, why Campbell's soup? Well, one, he ate a lot of Campbell's soup. He was poor and he loved the labeling. And he loved the labeling because it was instantly recognizable. You could look at a can of Campbell's soup and immediately everyone all over the world immediately recognized that symbol. And if you go to a store today and you walk down the aisle of soup, You'll see something very fascinating. You'll see, of course, Campbell soup cans, but then you'll see generic brands of soup. And what do they look like? And what are the colors? They're the same colors as the Campbell soup cans. I tell this to my students. I say, okay, what are the colors for a jar of mayonnaise? And it's the same. They're going to be white, blue, and yellow. Now, why? Well, because Hellman's and Best Foods are popular brands. They're actually made by the same company. And they really, you know pioneered the idea of what a mayonnaise jar should look like. And so that creates an image in our heads, an expectation of what that looks like. So all the other brands mimic their branding. This is fascinating because you don't have to force people to do this. It just happens naturally. You're trying to inform expectations. Studies have proven that when we look at brands, they actually occupy a, a piece of our headspace as young as two or three. Kids as young as two or three can recognize things like Disney or McDonald's or anything else. I'll never forget when I was uh, still a young father and my oldest was just two years old, uh, we went out to uh, a cleanup effort on our block. You know, it was a nice neighborhood, we wanted to clean up the block. So we were picking up trash and a piece of litter blew by and my two-year-old picked it up and looked at the label on the litter and said, Dunkin' Donuts. And I was shocked. Now, she didn't read. She couldn't read it, but she recognized the logo, even as early as that. And so that's real power. That's real power, the ability to capture our headspace um, and to capture our, our, our minds and our expectations. And, I, you know, you can prove this to yourself. I ask my students, and when they're in class, I say, okay, you have a runny nose, you go to blow your nose, what do you blow it on? You blow it on a Kleenex? No, you blow it on a tissue. Kleenex isn't the name for a product, it's the name for a brand. When you cut your finger, what do you do? You get a Band-Aid? No, you get an adhesive bandage. Band-Aid is again not the name of a product, it is the name of a brand. And so but they become so familiar to us that we instantly recognize them. So that's why he chose soup cans, because they had this instant recognition. Now, these were sold in a gallery in LA and they started selling individually, but the um, gallery owner recognized that this would be better if we did it as a series. Because of course, whoever sees a single soup can, you see them arrayed in multiple. It's the repetition that actually makes it so powerful. And so they, they stopped the sale and said, no, we're going to sell this as a series. Again, it's the thing that makes a, a soup can image is not that you see one of it, it's that you see it so many of them. You see many of them over and over and over again. 
And so he started making prints and he started using the silk screening process because it would replicate as close as you could to the original label. He even loved things like misregistrations where, you know, you see there's a big gap here. Misregistrations is where you have several different color layers in the silk screening process, one for black, one for yellow, one for red, etc. And you sometimes don't get them quite aligned. But he liked those because that showed that this was not hand painted or meticulously made, that it was mass produced. This kind of cemented his reputation. Some people uh, instantly claimed he was a fraud. Donald Judd, who would later become a minimalist sculptor, was an art critic at the time and, you know, considered this to be, you know, kind of just, you know, a fraud. But other people recognized immediately that this was something different. This was something new. So he goes back to New York and uh, Castelli, Leo Castelli, who is his gallery uh, owner, suggests that he should try something a little bit more serious, a little bit more in-depth, that this was considered to be uh, a little bit silly, that this was, people got this, but that it was a little bit too lighthearted. So that's when he went to his disaster series. Uh, Andy Warhol was just kind of fascinated by death, and he was also fascinated by obituaries. Uh, there was something really bizarre about an obituary. An obituary would go out in a mat, in a newsprint and it would be printed and there would suddenly be a hundred thousand copies of this person's picture and everybody would get to know this person through their picture but it was a person they had never known before but suddenly they would be famous even if for just a short while and there's something strange about that because at one point it elevates the person and makes them recognizable to you but because it's in a newsprint it's in a newspaper, and there's so many of them, it actually diminishes them. So he would make photostatic copies of these photos of car accidents or death reports or obituaries, and he would emphasize this multiplicity of the image by multiplying the image over and over again. This is perhaps one of my favorite that he did. This is Tuna Fish Disaster. In this case, these two women shared a can of tuna, but the tuna was tainted, and so they died of food poisoning. And what struck him about this is that the portraits of the women were actually smaller than the can of tuna. That they actually gave more space in the newspaper over to the can of tuna than they did to the actual women. So he replicated the image over and over again. And these are fascinating because they show the double-sided nature of fame, that the multiple images brought them to people's attention, but in a way it commodified them. That's, I think, the genius of Andy Warhol. He wasn't just using pop culture as a source for his material. He was realizing that pop culture was changing us. It was turning us into commodities. It was objectifying us. And Andy Warhol fully embraced that objectification. He didn't just want to highlight popular culture, he wanted to embrace it, he wanted to become a feature of pop culture. And you can see that in some of his most famous works. <coughs> I've mentioned it before, but uh, the Mona Lisa has only been really recognized as the world's greatest work of art for the last 200 years or so. Before that, it wasn't especially famous. And I've seen the Mona Lisa in person, and I have to say it's a disappointing experience because you're trying to get past these throngs of tourists, and then there's a big barrier, and then it's under two inches of bulletproof glass. And I realize as an art historian that my mental image of the Mona Lisa is based less on my actual seeing of the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, but more on me seeing it reproduced so many times in books and calendars and everywhere else the Mona Lisa itself has become a piece of popular culture. And so here he deals with that by using the four colors of the printing process, cyan, yellow, magenta, and black, the CMYK process, and he prints the Mona Lisa over and over again. Again, saying the multiplication of images is what makes the Mona Lisa so famous. And it's what elevates it, but at the same time, it diminishes it. And it's right at the same time that he kind of combines his two interests, his interests of death and fame, that he starts his series on Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe, of course, is one of the most famous 
you know, bombshells and actresses of the 1950s and 60s. And what's interesting about her is that everything about her life was kind of fake. When she died, she had very few possessions. All of her dresses and jewelry were owned by the studio. Most of her jewelry was just costume jewelry. It was very cheap. Her apartment was actually full of books. That's what she really did. Her name wasn't even, of course, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, uh, her name was Norma Jean uh, Baker. Uh, and also, she was probably the most famous blonde in history, and she wasn't really blonde. She was a bleach blonde. Uh, that deep, breathy voice that she was famous for was not her voice. She actually had a kind of squeaky voice. The whole thing was a kind of put on. So everything about her was kind of fake. And when she died of a drug overdose, or, you know, was assassinated by the Kennedys, take your pick. I'm not into conspiracy theories. I don't think that's true. But she really was a kind of living icon. So it makes sense that he would tackle her in this way. Now remember, he's Ruthenian Catholic. He understands images and the importance of images. And many of those religious images were on gold backgrounds. Here, he has created a diptych. A diptych is an inherently religious format. A diptych is a, a paneled painting that's designed to be folded up and then opened up for religious services. And by making this a diptych, he makes those religious connotations. He also makes those religious connotations by putting Marilyn on a gold background, almost like she is like an icon. The gold on an icon is meant to represent the spiritual space. Uh, an icon in the orthodox understanding is not supposed to be understood as a painting of the actual person. It's supposed to be a window onto heaven, and that gold represents the spiritual realm. It's not a real portrait. It's a spiritual portrait. And so he makes this spiritual portrait. But what I love about this painting is it shows, again, the duality of fame. He multiplies the image. She was famous because she was just one of the most photographed women in the world, so her image is multiplied. And over here on the one side of the diptych, on the gold background, she's always perfect, she's always forever smiling. But over here is a very different scene. Over here is black and white. And in the black and white, we have some that are overexposed, some that are underexposed, some that are smudged. Now, you guys live in the age of digital images, where each digital image is a perfect copy, but... I lived in the age of Xerox copying and photostatic prints, and I remember copying articles when I was getting my graduate degree. And, of course, if you make a copy of a copy, it gets smudged. If you run the copier too long, the toner gets bad. It goes awful. Uh, those kind of problems, we don't have nearly those many problems. Now the printers just never seem to print at all. They just kind of shut down. But they don't produce images like this. But this is a product of these early processes, these early photostatic processes that he was dealing with. It often did create smudged images. So what is he trying to say here? I think what he's trying to say is that fame itself is amazing because it can elevate you but it can also distort and destroy. Everybody uses his famous quote, you know, that, uh, you know, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Uh, and we use it kind of tongue in cheek about all these Instagram stars and, you know, pop up celebrities that are gone overnight. But I really don't think that's the way he meant it. I think that what he meant is that all of us, because of our pop culture, we're in fact being commodified. And Marilyn herself had been commodified. We don't know the real Marilyn Monroe. Her outward life was kind of fake, and her inward life was obviously kind of tragic. And so she had been turned into a commodity. She had been fully objectified. And boy, I can agree with this. I know this for certain because once upon a time, I designed slot machines. It was one of my first jobs right out of college. I designed slot machines, and our company owned the rights to Marilyn Monroe's image as long as it pertained to uh, slot machines. It's crazy. Uh, Marilyn Monroe's uh, estate broke up the rights to her image into a thousand little pieces and auctioned them all off. So if you wanted to make uh, uh, an image of Marilyn Monroe in a casino or in a slot machine, you had to pay our company to do that. And so I actually sold slot machines with Marilyn Monroe's image on it. And I made money off it, made a, quite a bit of money. It's kind of fascinating how that works. She really, truly has become a commodity, an object. And for Andy Warhol, this wasn't bad or good. This was just the reality of life. And he fully embraced it. He wanted his artworks to be commodities, and he wanted himself to be a commodity. He named his studio the factory for a reason. 
and quite frankly, by the mid-60s, he had handed off production to a bunch of assistants so that he wasn't even doing it anymore. There's a very famous episode where he went on a tour of lectures, but he didn't send himself. He actually sent imposters, uh, people dressed up like him. There was a famous one that went to the University of Utah, and in the process of the lecture, people realized this isn't the real Andy Warhol. This is somebody pretending to be Andy. Andy Warhol and they actually caught him it was you know a guy dressed up in an Andy Warhol fright wig and when Andy Warhol was asked about this he was like well you know you asked for Andy Warhol and I produced an Andy Warhol to him the commodity was what was important so I think he's probably the most Im important of the pop artists because while the other pop artists were commenting on pop culture he was commenting on what pop culture was doing to us I think you can really see it in this image. This is one of my favorite um, works. This is again Silk Green. This was a series of, of pictures he did. And this is called Sixteen Jackies. This is of course Jackie Kennedy, later Jackie Onassis. Jackie Kennedy was the first modern first lady. She was glamorous. She had these beautiful uh, dresses. She was the first one to do a live television show from inside the White House and invite people to see the Christmas decorations. She So many traditions that we just accept as standard for the White House, she was the person who initiated them. And she was an incredibly photographed woman and was noted for her glamour. Uh, the way that people recognized her was her famous pillbox hats, and you can see those images here where she is happy and beaming. Of course, a lot of it was a lie. She had a very uh, difficult marriage with JFK. JFK was a womanizer and had many affairs, and she too her, herself had affairs to deal with that. But because she was the first lady, she felt like she had to keep up this public image. This all came crashing down when JFK was assassinated in November of 1963 in Dealey Plaza in Dallas. And when he died, um, she... Uh, you know, still had to keep up this public persona. So the images we're seeing here are come from two different phases of her life. They come from before, these images here come from before the assassination. And these others, like this, this over here and these here, that show her in black and veiled, these actually come from uh, JFK's funeral. Now, at that funeral, she maintained a very stoic facade. She didn't cry. She didn't weep. Uh, and people actually criticized her at, at the time for this, but I think that's actually unfair. She had a very strict congregationalist upbringing, and in the congregationalist tradition, despair is seen as a kind of sin, because if you're a Christian, you believe in the resurrection, and so you shouldn't show overt forms of despair. So to her, this was probably a, a show of piety and strength to to not be to show overt grief or it may just have been shell shock in dealing with the reality of death but both of these are very clearly facades both of these are personas that she put on these are public masks that she put on and the multiplication of images shows that again while we were very familiar with Jackie we really didn't know her at all there's only one image here that perhaps shows something beneath the facade and it's this image here, which is repeated over here. And this image was uh, probably one of the few genuine candid moments. This is actually taken from this photograph here. This is the photograph of LBGA being sworn in as president of the United States on Air Force One. She is still wearing the clothes that she wore when JFK was assassinated. She still got his blood on him when this photo was taken. Her husband is in the cargo hold in a coffin being flown back to Washington, D.C. This is just hours after his death, and you can see the state of shock. By combining all of these images together, Andy Warhol is making this incredibly forceful commentary on the nature of fame and the nature of images. Do we know the real Jackie Kennedy? Would we ever know the real Jackie Kennedy? Halfway through the 1960s, um, Andy Warhol gets pretty deep into his kind of entourage. He actually becomes a manager for the Velvet Underground, becomes good friends with Lou Reed. He becomes the center of a kind of bohemian and diverse group of people centered around uh, his studio, which was kind of 
not really a studio. It was more of a nightclub. It was wrapped in aluminum foil. It was silver. It was bizarre. And he actually stopped uh, producing a lot of art. Instead, started producing some experimental films, including a film of uh, Sunset going down on the Empire State Building that he slowed down until it was eight hours long. He also was very openly homosexual and did a lot of controversial kind of uh, videos and uh, not videos but films uh, regarding that as well uh, and it really became a, a kind of frenetic scene he ceased to be a kind of artist that was producing work and he was more of an auteur kind of directing whole teams of artists and he himself turned himself into a brand and it's at this time where his life was struck by tragedy on uh, June 3rd, 1968, a radical feminist who had written a manifesto called Scum, Society for Cutting Up Men, claimed that he had stolen one of her screenplays, which doesn't seem to be true. Uh, he tried to push her off and say, uh, leave me alone, at which point she produced a gun and she shot him and uh, Mario Amaya, who was an art critic and a curator there at the same time. Uh, Mario got away uh, relatively unscathed, was shot, but relatively unscathed, uh, but uh, Warhol himself was severely uh, damaged. Uh, his abdominal cavity was breached and he had to go in through many hours of surgery. Only uh, a couple years later did he let Alice Neal uh, paint him, and you can see these terrible scars. Uh, he had to wear a truss for the rest of his life. Eventually in 1987 he had to go in for gallbladder surgery related to this, and he died from complications of this, so eventually this bullet took his life. Uh, but after that, he was never the same. He shut the factory down, he shut down most of the entourage, etc., and retreated kind of into private life. When he talked about it, he remarked on the nature of this bizarre experience of being shot. He said, Before I was shot, I always thought that I was more half there than all there. I always suspected that I was watching TV instead of living life. People sometimes say that the way things happen in movies is unreal, but actually it's the way things happen in life that's unreal. The movies make emotions look so strong and real, whereas when things really do happen to you, it's like watching television. You don't feel anything. Right when I was being shot, and ever since, I knew that I was watching television. The channels switch, but it's all television. I think this is why Andy Warhol is, is going to be remembered as the one of the great... Uh, you know, artists of the 20th century, because so many people regard his stuff as a kind of fraud, as a kind of put on. But in reality, what he was doing was commenting on the nature of reality, that through popular culture, we have all become commodified to a certain degree. Oh my gosh, I would have loved to have seen what he would have done with social media. <laughs> Can you even imagine? Uh, social media, I tell my students, you know, if a, if a service is free, then you're not the customer, you're the product. <laughs> On Twitter and Facebook, you're not the customer, you're the product. You're there to sell other people, to draw eyeballs. And if you're entertaining, if you're performing, you're good for Facebook. You're not the customer on Facebook or Twitter, you're the product. You have been commodified and you don't even know it. And it's clear that he saw all of this coming. I would have loved to have seen what he would have done in the age of social media. He saw all this coming and he knew this was coming, that this was a, a fundamental change of the way we relate to images and the way we relate to visual culture and life. And I think that's why he'll be remembered. That seems as good a place as any to end uh, the discussion on pop art. So we only have a couple more lectures left. And those couple more lectures are really going to race through the last 40 years. We're going to basically say, what happened? What were the trends? And it's just going to give you a taste. If you want to know more about contemporary art, I strongly suggest you take my contemporary art class. Uh, it's coming up in this, um, this next semester. So at least at the time I was recording this. <laughs> Sometimes these, rec these, these, these uh, recordings have a life of their own. They continue past the age of the class. But we'll talk about, um, you know, where things are going. But if you want to get more in-depth of that, please take my uh, contemporary art class. Thanks to everyone for hanging in there. I know this was a long one. Uh, but we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.